Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, you may have seen my recent Cassini video, and you may also have noticed that partway through the video, I accidentally mispronounced the planet Saturn as Jupiter, which is probably one of the dumbest mistakes I've ever made, and I apologize. So, uh, to make up for it, I figured I would highlight some other dumb moments in the history of space and rocketry. Now, let's be clear on this. We're not going to take, um, you know, unfortunate things that were poorly understood. For example, yes, it was sort of funny when SpaceX had a rocket explode on the pad, but the reason for that was actually down to some pretty complicated material science and physics. Similarly, yes, every time a moon landing denier opens their mouth, that's pretty dumb, but it's not really anything to do with space science. So yeah, my uh, 10 or so lists. Ten. The first one is the Russian Polyus spacecraft, which you may not have heard of. Now, uh, in the mid 80s, Russia, a Soviet Union, was developing their Buran shuttle, which looked pretty much like the NASA shuttle. It had a different launch vehicle, the Energia rocket, which was awesome and could in theory carry something like 100 tons into orbit. Now, the rocket was ready way before the spacecraft and they wanted to do a test launch, so they required a simulated payload. Another project had a, the Polyus spacecraft, which was possibly a weapon system in space. Now, it was going to be mounted to the side of this because they figured they could get a free launch to test this. It, uh, for complicated reasons, actually had to be mounted backwards so that its engines that would boost it into its final orbit were at the top. So the rocket launch carried it up most of the way into orbit and then it would detach. It would do a 180 degree flip and then fire its engines. Now the launch went off perfectly. The Energia was a good rocket. The spacecraft began performing its 180 degree flip, fired up its engines, and then continued to rotate all the way around 360 degrees. So the engine started slowing the payload down until it fell and was destroyed. Nine. Number nine on my list is the Apollo TV camera. So uh, the astronauts took TV cameras to the surface of the moon so that they could capture the imagination of the public. With Apollo 11, it was a black and white TV camera and it would be sending the signals back to Earth at about 10 frames per second, 320 lines. Now, the receiving station for Apollo 11 uh, was in Australia. And, uh, well, they didn't have complex equipment for converting one TV signal to another. So the TV stations, they pointed a camera at the monitor displaying the TV and then sent that across the satellite, further degrading the signal where it was broadcast to the world. So the first pictures or first video of Neil Armstrong coming down the ladder are frankly awful. And uh, the good news was, of course, that the original signal was being recorded to tape back in Australia. So in theory, at a later date, they could take that, that signal, make a much better copy. And indeed, people showed uh, there's somebody that filmed a Super 8 version of this. And there's some fragments of that. But the data tapes, yeah, these, these were sent back to the US and promptly lost and probably recorded over when they were needing data tapes towards the end of the late 80s for the, for the Landsat program. B bonus points for Alan Bean on Apollo 12, where uh, they, while setting up the new color TV camera, accidentally pointed at the sun and burned out the tube, making it useless. <laughs> For number eight, we go to Europe. So Ariane 5 was a $7 billion project to develop a bigger and better launcher for the European Space Agency. It was able to carry a seven ton rocket, or oh, sorry, payload up to geostationary orbit and on its very first test, carrying a very real scientific payload, it went out of control at 37 seconds into the launch. This was unfortunate. The reason for this was because they had reused the software from Ariane 4 to save money. And that was fine, sort of, but part of the software was taking the velocity as calculated by the inertial guidance system and converting its 64-bit double precision value into a 16-bit integer. And as soon as that 16-bit integer went above 32,767, it flipped around and went negative. That meant the routine started seeing garbage and declared a problem. 
the spacecraft then went out of control and destroyed itself. Now, <laughs> okay, so first of all, you've got this dumb process of converting a perfectly valid 30, a 64-bit number into a 16-bit number, risking all sorts of problems. But even worse is the routine that caused the problem was uh, something that set up the inertial guidance system at launch or just before launch. It wasn't even needed after the spacecraft took off. However, they decided that it was good to keep it running straight after the countdown in case they needed to do a quick reset. So it would run up to T plus 40 seconds and then shut itself off. And of course, the failure occurred at 37 seconds. The reason it occurred is because, of course, Ariane 5 was a much more powerful and faster rocket and therefore saturated the value before this 40 second cutoff that was fine in the Ariane 4. Seven. Number seven, the Schiaparelli lander, also from ESA. During descent to Mars, it of course went through its usual aero braking. Uh, it uh, fired the engines, it fired a parachute, and as soon as the parachute fired or deployed, uh, the spacecraft spun like crazy, as sometimes they do when you've got these complex forces happening. That high-speed spin saturated its uh, inertial guidance system again, and it decided, since it was getting bad data, that it was actually had already landed on Mars. So they cut the parachutes. Great. I mean, just think about the programmer here, or think about the program. Oh, the altimeter says we're way high. The radar altimeter says we're really high. The clock says we couldn't possibly have landed. But the inertial guidance system, it's got some sort of crazy idea that we might have landed. Hey, let's cut this parachute. There. Let's step away from inertial guidance systems for a while and talk about the Venera spacecraft. Now, the Venera spacecraft, of course, went to the surface of Venus, which is, wow, that is awesome, you engineers. However, why did you have so many problems with your lens caps? So, Venera 9, 10, 11, and 12 all had issues with lens caps not coming off the cameras. Now, I could understand the first couple maybe having some issues, but you kept having these problems. So they kept on losing footage simply because the lens cap wouldn't deploy. And to add insult to injury, while the lens caps came off on Venera 13 and 14, for Venera 14, the lens cap fell off and landed underneath one of the surface sensors. Therefore, they were testing the properties of the lens cap rather than the surface of Venus. Five. For number five, no talk of dumb mistakes in spacecraft would be complete without the discussion of Mars Climate Orbiter. Now, that was a fine spacecraft designed to go into orbit around the Mars. However, it was navigated by groups of people that would use imperial units on one side and metric units on the other. And due to some uh, issues with translation between the two groups, at one point when it was making a course correction, it made a burn in meters per second when the navigation team had requested a change in feet per second. Therefore, it was 3.3 times bigger than expected. Uh, so therefore, when the spacecraft went into orbit to perform its aerobraking maneuver, it was way too low and burned up in the Martian atmosphere. You might have seen this awesome meme that says there are two types of countries, those that use metric and those that have landed a man on the moon. Well, I have a different version that says there are two types of countries, those that use metric and those that use metric to land on the moon and then crash the space probe into Mars because they couldn't convert metric and imperial. Look, yeah, I'm glad NASA has fixed all this by now. Four the Hubble Space Telescope Mirror. Now, the mirror, of course, had to be ground to a very exacting shape. And since it was going to space, it was the most accurately ground mirror in the world at the time. However, they ground it to the wrong shape. The company that had been contracted to do this uh, mirror figuring, They'd had a lot of work with it. They had their stock instruments that they used to determine the shape. So for the first few steps of grinding the mirror to the correct uh, state, they, they used uh, their in-house hardware to 
produce or to, to determine the shape of the mirror. But the stringent requirements for the Hubble Space Telescope required a specialist calibration instrument to be built, one to the same exacting standards. Somewhere along the way though, an error was made and a particular mirror element was about 1.3 millimeters out of place. So in the final phase, they ground the whole thing wrong by about a whole two micrometers at the outer edge of the mirror. So that meant that when the mirror went into space, it was the wrong shape and was out of focus. Now that's dumb enough, but they actually had a, one later test prior to launch where they, um, they had to use the old hardware. And the old hardware, hardware said, hey, you're getting spherical aberration, this is wrong. But they rejected that because their good instrument, their special single high quality test gear was still saying that they were right on target. I mean, the happy ending, of course, is that uh, after they figured out the problem, they were able to send up a servicing mission to put in a, cor a correction system that would correct the uh, images. And then later, they made sure that all the instrument packages that were sent up to the HST included the correction built in, so they were able to get a fully functioning, amazing instrument after the fact. My next dumbest moment in rocket science history goes way, way back to Robert Goddard. Yes, he was a pioneer. He did develop some of the earliest liquid-fueled rockets. However, he didn't understand basic physics. He fell for the pendulum rocket fallacy. That is, his first rockets actually put the thrusters at the top in the fuel tank underneath, thinking that it would hang like a pendulum and become elegant and stable. However, physics doesn't work like that, and as soon as it took off, it flew over in an elegant arc and crashed into the ground. This is a mistake that many people make when they come into rocket science, and to be fair, he was a pioneer, but it's the same, he made the mistake, and many other people keep making this dumb mistake, so that's why it's on my list. The Proton Rocket and its uh, inverted accelerometer. Oh, we're back to inertial guidance units, aren't we? So yeah, Proton Rocket had a, one particular Proton Rocket after launch. It went off course. It wobbled around and eventually crashed. Later, upon investigating the wreckage, they discovered that the accelerometers had been put in upside down. And yeah, the accelerometers apparently required a technician to go in and install it. They had arrows on them to show which orientation they were in. But the mounting plates that they were to be mounted to didn't have arrows that uh, lined up with these. They did have mounting pins to make it hard to mount these accelerometers in anything but the correct rotation. But apparently with enough brute force, you could still mount these things upside down. And so, yeah, it was getting its signals backwards and the Proton rocket was unable to control itself correctly and crashed. So that is number two in the dumbest moments in space history. Wow. So for the number one dumbest moment in rocket science, I have two options. For number one, I have Britain, who developed an orbital rocket and then cancelled it. They're the only nation ever to have developed an orbit-capable rocket and then step away from said capability. They could have been much more pioneering, they could have done great things, but no, the, the politicians decided they didn't want to pay for it and uh, instead ended up paying even more money to the US to launch their spacecraft. So, yeah. Alternatively, since we're talking about spending lots of money, the entire space shuttle program could be argued to be one of the great moments of dumb in the history of rocket science. So, yeah, I mean, on the surface, the space shuttle seemed like a good idea. However, after it went through many iterations of design by committee and picked up all sorts of capabilities and features that made it even more expensive and complex and dangerous to fly, it never really managed to satisfy all of the goals and became a bit of a boondoggle, to be honest. And don't get me wrong, the Space Shuttle is jaw-droppingly amazing piece of hardware. I love it. It's just this awesome bit of technology. It's a testament to all the amazing engineers and scientists and programmers and all the money spent that it did as well as it did. 
But you just have to look at this artist's impression of what they thought the vehicle processing would have been like and compare it to the actual photograph of what vehicle processing was like. They were never able to turn the rockets around, the, the shuttles around, and relaunch them quickly. And so that's why the shuttle never really material, that's why the goals never really happened. You know, maybe we will one day get to that stage. It's great to see that uh, winged spacecraft are actually coming back with the, the Dream Chaser and the X-37, but the space shuttle has one of these weird places in my heart where I admire it, but I can't honestly say that it was necessary or good at what, it's, what it did. And so that's my list of dumbest moments in rocket science. Now, I may have missed some very important ones, I'm sure I have, and we all know that in the future there will be even more dumb moments to talk about. Because, let's face it, people are very, very good at finding new ways to do things badly. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.